I don't know anybody else that uses cat sticks in the middle of summer. We got one. For those of you that are just joining us on Facebook, we're having a riveting discussion, a, a discussion about chapstick and who uses it in the middle of the summer. Quick show of hands. Sister oh, wow, I'm not alone. You see, now this just goes to show, if you feel like there's something weird about you, chances are there's a whole lot of other people that's just as weird. So take encouragement this evening. I thought, you know, I mean, really the trick is, you know you're an expert chapsticker. When, when even in the middle of summer, it doesn't melt. You know what you're doing, right? You take care of it. Oh, praise God. Is everybody saying cool for the most part? Anybody got outside jobs? Nobody? Does anybody have a, does anybody have a real job where they work outside? Oh. Yes, thank you, Sister Destiny. Let's clarify that. <laughs> Those are the pampered ones. Man, amen. All right, good to see everybody this evening. Um, youth, welcome. Nice, nice to see you this evening. Um, praise God. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, first I would like to ask you to... Find your way to Psalm chapter 2. Put a bookmark there. And then make your way to Revelation chapter 14. Psalm chapter 2. Then Revelation chapter 14. When you get there, do me a favor and just say, Amen. If you're still looking, say, Oh my. The Amens have it. Okay. Has anybody been watching the Olympics? I, I enjoy them, uh, for the most part. Um, and I, I love competition. I always have. I grew up playing sports. I, I love competition. And, and one thing I've noticed is, uh, typically, we all love uh, heroes. We all we all love uh, an underdog story. We all love somebody fighting against the odds, uh, coming out on top. We we love heroes. We love winners, uh, especially probably in the in the realm of sports. Uh, certainly, and certainly in movies. Um, you know, we we love we love a good hero in a movie. Uh, we love somebody that that wins, and as I said, overcomes the enemy, overcomes the odds. I'm certainly not endorsing a, a world view of success or heroes, uh, but, but when we look at the Bible, when we look at the, the Christian life as the Bible teaches it to us, uh, what we see is that the Christian life is one that is described in terms of victory. It's one that's described in terms of overcoming. Uh, a Christian is one uh, who, in Jesus Christ and man by his grace, uh, comes out on top, if you will. Um, and for example, in Romans 8.37, it says this, But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Okay, you're going to have to take my word for it. I know that I, I, know I texted him to Sister Pat, so uh, you, I just need you to trust me this evening. That's what Romans 8.37 says. In all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Now, that, that's really um, a strong word. It doesn't say we get by by the skin of our teeth. It doesn't say that we just sort of, sort of limp along and eventually kind of stumble across the finish line or, or we uh, barely make it through the difficulties and the struggles and the challenges that we face, but we overwhelmingly conquer through our efforts, through our, our wisdom, our smarts, our street smarts, our abilities? No, through him who loved us, through Jesus Christ, the, the source of, of our power, the source of our victory. Uh, the Apostle John in 1 John 5, 4 through 5 says this. He says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 
And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, he said, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So loved ones, if you're in here tonight and you're in Christ, you're born again, in a sense you've already won. You've already won. And you might say, well, Scott, you haven't seen the week I've had. Well, experientially, we may not quite be there yet, but spiritually, the reality of it is, in Christ Jesus, you've already won. Your sins are forgiven, you have peace with God, uh, you have the assurance of salvation, and one day, the, the world as we know it is going to come to an end. And if you're in Christ, then you will, will stand victorious. You will stand victorious on the day of judgment, while there are others that will be judged guilty by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ you will be found innocent. And even if you are facing trials today, they don't define you, they don't overcome you, they don't tear you down, they don't steal your joy, they don't steal your peace, or rather they're not supposed to. Sometimes we allow it. Uh, Satan cannot take anything from us. We give those things to him because Jesus said, my joy I give to you. So who's going to take it unless we give it away? But the, the ultimate point being is that if you're in Christ, then you are already a victor. You already have the victory. And when we come to Revelation chapter 14, we're going to see one of the most triumphant groups of people that the world has ever known, and that the world will ever know. They are going to enter into the tribulation, and they are going to uh, be, um, if you will, Christ's, voice, the, the gospel message will be preached through them uh, for almost the entirety of the tribulation, and they will come to the end of it. They may be battle-weary, but make no mistake about it, they're going to be triumphant. They're going to be victorious. No matter what the Antichrist, no matter what Satan throws at them, they are guaranteed victory. And this group of people we was introduced to in chapter 7, you may remember, as the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. They are going to be the first fruit of the true Israel that loves Jesus Christ, that accepts him as their Messiah, that follows him, that preaches the gospel, that, that lays, they're ready to lay their life down for him. And at this point in the book of Revelation, it, it's going to mean that they've been through the seal judgments, they've been through the trumpet judgments, and one commentator uh, said this. He made a really good observation. He said, quote, By this point in the tribulation, the world will have experienced the unimaginable horrors of the first six seals. There will have been widespread wars, severe famines, deadly plagues, and terrible earthquakes and other natural disasters, all of which will result in millions of deaths. Sin will run rampant and unchecked over the earth, fueled by Satan and his demon hosts, Antichrist, will unleash the most terrible persecution the world has ever known, and countless thousands of Christians and Jews will be slaughtered, yet these 144,000 will be found victorious. One of the reasons they're going to be able to, to withstand, one of the reasons they're going to be able to endure is because you may remember in chapter 7, it says that God sealed them on their forehead to protect them. God specifically told the angels that was holding back the wind and holding back the judgment, said, don't let any harm come to them until the 144,000 have been sealed. It was a sign of their protection. And that we know what that seal is. We don't have to wonder because if you notice in chapter uh, 14, verse 1, it says that the 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their forehead. That is the actual seal that God is going to put on them. He's going to put the name of Christ and the name of his father, and that is going to be their seal. They are going to be, if you will, a fulfillment of the promise of Psalm 37, verses 39 through 40, that says, But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. These 144,000 are going to be the perfect fulfillment 
of this psalm. They take their refuge in the Lamb, and they will be protected by Him. And, and this is really an amazing thought. It really is, because during the seven-year tribulation, as we've been studying, many are going to die. Many are going to die, Jews and Gentiles. Most of them are going to die as martyrs at the hands of the Antichrist. But the rest, and we'll talk about this more when we get into chapter 20, the rest are going to go into the millennial kingdom alive. And as far as the 144,000 go, they're going to be part of that group. Not one of them is going to die. Not one of them is going to be martyred. But they're all going to enter into the millennial kingdom fully alive, giving praise to God, and absolutely victorious. Now, I think it's necessary to remind you, or maybe not necessary, but, but good to remind you, that we're still in the interlude between the blowing of the seventh trumpet and the beginning of the bold judgments. Uh, you remember in chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh trumpet sounded, and then, as we've already experienced on multiple occasions, and I think it's worth reminding, that in prophetic scripture it is not uncommon that the narrative can, can chronologically bounce uh, back and forth. For example, uh, some visions will describe the nature of the future tribulation as a whole, and then sometimes uh, the, the uh, vision may portray judgments that will be fulfilled in strict sequence. Sometimes the vision will back up and it will fill in details. For example, chapter 12, chapter 13, where we were discussing uh, Satan and the Antichrist. And this is chapter 14, launching forward. We are now going to get a, a, a glimpse, if you will, a, a view of the end of the tribulation and what it's going to look like. And then we will come back again in chapter 15 to more of the Antichrist kingdom, what it looks like, and how it's going to be torn down. So if you've got your Bibles with you, in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, First, I, I want you to notice uh, their position. John says, then I looked, and behold. Have you lost count yet how many times the word behold is in the book of Revelation? Over and over and over again, John is just absolutely blown away by what he's seeing. And anytime we read the word behold in Scripture, whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, it, it always means stop a minute, something important is about to be said. Stop and think about what it is you're about to read because this is really important. Or to put it in a modern day vernacular, some of you may remember the translation we gave at the very beginning of the study. Hey, check this out. Don't miss it. Pay attention. And, and John is stepping back and he's seeing this amazing sight and he's looking and, he's in, and he says, Behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. I, I can't tell you how monumental this verse is. And, and there's times when you come to Scripture and you read something that is so phenomenal, so tremendous, so amazing, I, I feel like a five-year-old standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon trying to explain to you how I feel and what I'm seeing. It, words just seem to fall short. And when we begin to talk about a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ standing in Jerusalem, standing upon Mount Zion in his victory at the end of all time, after Satan is defeated, the Antichrist, the false prophet are cast into hell, the new heaven and earth are about to come. When I consider that, I feel like I'm standing on the edge of a canyon and I, and I fall short of words. And you know what? Maybe sometimes we should fall short of words. Maybe we should fall short of words when we're considering the majesty of our King, when we're considering the glory of Christ in all of his victory, in all of his accomplishment, in all of his fulfillment of the will of God the Father. Perhaps we should sit silently before him. But I'm standing behind the pulpit and my job is to teach, so I can't just stand here quietly for 30 minutes, now, although that might not be a terrible thing. Uh, sometimes silence is a whole lot better than uh, speaking. But th this is a tremendous vision of 
several prophecies in the Old Testament. There are several prophecies of Jesus standing on Mount Zion uh, in his total victory. Turn back with me to Psalm chapter 2. This is, this is one of the most clear prophecies of the victory of Christ at the end of the tribulation. And beginning at verse, actually, you know what? Let's, uh, let's begin at verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Does that sound familiar in our study on the book of Revelation? Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Now listen to the rest of this. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthen ware. Charles Spurgeon, in his amazing work uh, on his exposition on the book of Psalms in the treasury of David, he said this. Now, I want you to listen to this. This is amazing. He said, quote, After God has laughed, he shall speak. And he, he's um, expounding on Psalm 2. After God has laughed, he shall speak. He needs not smite. The breath of his lips is enough. At the moment when their power is at its height, and their fury most violent, then shall his word go forth against them. And what is it that he says? It is a very galling sentence. Yet, says he, despite your malice, Despite your tumultuous gatherings, despite the wisdom of your counsels, despite the craft of your lawgivers, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Is not that a grand exclamation? He has already done that which the enemy seeks to prevent. While they are proposing, he has disposed the matter. Jehovah's will is done and man's will frets and raves in vain. God's anointed is appointed and shall not be disappointed. you got to love Spurgeon. He has a way with words, doesn't he? Look back through all the ages of infidelity. Hearken to the high and hard things which men have spoken against the Most High. Listen to the rolling thunder of earth's volleys against the majesty of heaven and then think that God is saying all the while, yet have I set my king upon my hill of Zion. Yet Jesus reigns, yet he sees of the travail of his soul, and his unsuffering kingdom yet shall come, when he shall take unto himself his great power, and reign from the river unto the ends of the earth. Even now he reigns in Zion, and our glad lips Sound forth the praises of the Prince of Peace. Greater conflicts may here be foretold, but we may be confident that victory will be given to our Lord and King Jesus Christ. Glorious triumphs are yet to come. Hasten them, we pray thee, O Lord. It is Zion's glory and joy that her King is in her, guarding her from foes and filling her with good things. Jesus sits upon the throne of grace and the throne of power in the midst of his church. In him is Zion's best safeguard. Let her citizens be glad in him. Man, that's good, isn't it? You want me to read it over for you again? No. Nah. And that's it. It doesn't matter what Satan does Jesus Christ is going to reign and rule from Jerusalem. It doesn't matter what the Antichrist does. 
Jesus Christ is already set upon his holy hill on Mount Zion. In God's eyes, it's already finished. Experientially, for the people alive during the tribulation, not yet. But in God's eyes, he speaks the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. And it's already done. The prophecy may yet to be fulfilled, but make no mistake about it, loved ones, it will be fulfilled. Regardless of what the amillennials think, it will be fulfilled. Here's another one. Isaiah, 40, Isaiah 24, 23. For the Lord, Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Phenomenal prophecy that will be fulfilled, and we're seeing it here in Revelation chapter 14. Now don't turn away from the book of Psalms just yet because there's another wonderful promise that God made that the 144,000 are the fulfillment of. Partial, uh, because we can also see the fulfillment in and of our own lives. But th there they are, standing with Christ on Mount Zion. What a privileged place. What a place of honor to be able to stand there with their king and with Christ. And as he is reigning and ruling, they, they have a place of honor that God has granted them. And they've been, they've been protected the entire tribulation. They've been watched over. They, they were sealed and guarded by God. Now turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 91. And in them we see the fulfillment of this uh, also amazing psalm. Psalm 91. Verse 5. Actually, you know what? Verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Wonderful promises. Turn, turn to Revelation 14. Wonderful promises. And the 144,000 is the proof that God keeps his promises. How many of you know God has never broken a single promise? All right, there's one person way in the left that knows God doesn't break his promises. Hey, I, I told y'all from the very beginning, I like group participation. I'm not, I'm not going to stop and until, you know, we start to get a little bit going here. So let me try this one more time. It's working. How many of you know God has never broken a promise? Yeah. Amen. And that's good news because he hasn't broken any up to now. And how many of you know he's not going to start now? Every promise he has made will hold true and faithful till the end of time. And the 144,000 are going to be standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. That's their position. Now we see uh, their praise. Notice in verses 2 and 3. John said, I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. 
And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Now this may very well be the same heavenly chorus that began, you may remember, back in chapter 5. It began with the 24 elders and then it went from there to the uh, four living creatures and then it went from there to the angels and then harps were joined in and then all of creation joined in and, and this, this outburst of praise just built and built and built and built. Uh, and this may very well be a continuance of that. But something that, that I noticed that I couldn't, I couldn't help but, but kind of latch on to for a minute uh, was that this isn't just going to be noise. I mean, if anybody has the, the displeasure of standing near me on Sunday mornings while we're worshiping and I'm singing, you're hearing noise. Uh, but I, I'm trying to be obedient to Scripture because it says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, it doesn't say make a joyful, sweet melody to the Lord. I believe God knew when he created people like me, I couldn't sing, the, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. So he said make joyful noise, and that's all I'm doing. I'm being obedient to Scripture. Uh, but and now nobody's going to sit around me on Sunday mornings because they don't want to be subjected to that. But this this has a, a a beauty to it. It has it has a melody to it. Notice, if you will, that it said there's a quality, and it says uh, John said at the end of verse 14, I, the the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. It's it's a beautiful sound. It's a melodic sound as they're singing unto the Lord. But interestingly enough, uh, it, it says the only ones that are going to know it are the 144,000. The 140, that doesn't seem fair, does it? Why do they get a song? And I want to know what this song is. I want to sing. You know, it, it, almost, it almost seems a little, a little unfair. But I, I will tell you this. In a day and age, uh, th this is in stark contrast uh, to the day and age we live in where, you know, there's participation trophies and everybody wins and uh, if you want it, you get it and you're entitled to it and all of this talk of equality and justice. Uh, how, many of, how many of you know God doesn't owe us an explanation? He said the 144,000 are going to be the only ones that know this song. That's the way it is. And he feels no need to explain it to anybody. I love the way God does that. There's a part of me that almost hears God saying, you know what, put your pride down, get over it. That's my blessing to them. It doesn't concern you. Kind of like when Jesus looked at Peter. Peter was like, hey, what about this guy? What about him? If you don't mind me giving you the Scott Rush interpretation, Jesus basically said, Peter, mind your own business. Whatever I got him doing, that's between me and him. You don't have to worry about it. You just follow me, and that's all you have to concern yourself with. But I did find it interesting. Henry Morris had an interesting take on this. And he said this quote about the song and them being the only ones that know it. He said, quote, Although the words of the song of the 144,000 are not recorded, it surely dwells in part, at least, on the great truth that they had been redeemed from the earth. Although in one sense all saved people have been redeemed from the earth, these could know the meaning of such a theme in a more profound way than others. They had been saved after the rapture, at that time in history when man's greatest persecutions and God's greatest judgments were on the earth. It was at such a time that they, like Noah, had found grace in the eyes of the Lord and had been separated from all that dwell upon the earth. Not only had they been redeemed spiritually, but precursively as it were, they had been redeemed from the very curse on the earth being protected from pain and death by the guarding seal. Fair enough. Fair enough. But again, I come back to my original point. God decreed that they were going to be the only ones that know it, and that's good enough for me. And they are singing this song unto the Lord. And, and something that struck me here, one of the marks of a triumphant Christian loved ones is that they find a way to praise God in all circumstances, no matter how terrible. Here they are in the middle of the tribulation. Well, this is the end of the tribulation. Uh, it, it fast forwarded, remember. But during their entirety of being upon the earth during the tribulation, being obedient to God's will, observing the judgments, uh, dealing, dealing with the issues that were there, they still found a way to praise God, to have a song in their heart, like David in the wilderness, like 
Paul and Barnabas at the midnight hour as they were uh, beaten, thrown into jail, put in the stocks. At midnight, they're singing praise unto God. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Loved ones, how many of you know Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise despite the circumstances? Despite the circumstances, he's worthy of our praise. As a matter of fact, I've come to find that, that my praise and my worship unto God is more intense when times are tough. It's easy to praise him when things are going good, isn't it? Man, all the bills are being paid. There's a little extra money in, in the checking account. You're making par, not triple bogey. Uh, you know, the kids are acting right, and, and they're getting good grades in school. I mean, you name it, things are going good. It's easy to thank God. But, but what about when things aren't going so good? What about when the bills are stacking up and the money isn't matching what about when the kids aren't acting right? What about when they're downright rebelling? What about when the relationship is struggling? I mean, take your pick. We all, we all know the struggles that we face. Is he still not worthy of our praise? Let's not be people that only worship Christ during the good times. Let's be people that worship Christ regardless of the times. Because as I say, he is worthy of our praise, good or bad times. And, and we see a wonderful illustration of that here. Now, John gives a description of these 144,000 that I found challenging. And then we're going to have a point of application uh, when we reach the end of it. Uh, in verses 4 through 5, note, notice the description that he gives. He says, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. We discovered a while back that in the tribulation, under the rule of the Antichrist, uh, sexual sin is going to run rampant. And, and we talked about that. And, 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 and it's sexual sin of, of every sort, every despicable vile swords, and, and it's going to be worldwide. Um, the, divine re the divine restraint has been moved, 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, the, the restraining hand of God will be lifted. Uh, man will be handed over to their sin, to their passions, and it, it's just going to be an, an absolute uh, wretched, wicked time. But all of these resist the temptation. All of these resist the sexual sin. Now, when it says that these are the ones who have not defiled, um, been defiled with women, now, this doesn't necessarily mean none of them are married. It is a possibility some of them are married because there is uh, sex and marriage doesn't defile. Sex and marriage, as God has created it, it, it is pure. There's an honor. There's a, there's a holiness there because it's the way God has designed it. It is honoring to him. It, it is defiling when, when there is sex outside of marriage. It is defiling when there is adultery for someone that is married. That is defiling, but these will stand apart in purity from the surrounding sin. If they're married, they are 100% loyal to their spouse. If they're not married, they are 100% loyal to Christ, to their virginity, until the day they are either married or the day they are taken into heaven they are literally fulfilling the command in first thessalonians 4 3 that says this is the will of god your sanctification that is that you abstain from sexual immorality and this is precisely what they're going to do robert murray mcshane when he was speaking to a, a group of young ministers gave them this counsel and I guess there is a reason the young people are in here tonight because I want you to pay special attention to what I'm about to say. He says this, quote, Do not forget the culture of the inner man, I mean of the heart, how diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember you are God's sword, his instrument, I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great 
talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Youth, you want to be used by God, which I pray is your heart's desire? Stay pure before Jesus Christ and watch what he'll do in your life. Say no to the world. Say no to the world's way of doing things. Say yes to God. Stay pure and watch how he'll use you. I like what he says. A holy minister, a holy Christian, is an awful weapon in the hand of God. So they stayed pure. Next, at the end of verse 4, notice what else it says. It says, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They are totally loyal to Jesus. Totally submitted to his will. 100% laid their lives down Wherever the lamb goes, they go. And I like what John Phillips said. They allow no rivals, no refusals, and no restraints to mar their dedication to the lamb. Does he need someone to stand upon the steps of the Vatican and cry out against the marriage of Christendom to the beast? There are 144,000 ready to go. Does the Lord need someone to speak against the beast at some high function of state and roundly denounce him, his policy, his statecraft, his religion, his economic boycott, his mark, his ministers, his alliance with Satan? There's 144,000 eager to do just that. Does the Lamb need evangelists to proclaim to the untold millions the gospel of the coming kingdom of God? The 144,000 are ready to go. This is the very spirit of their consecration as they followed the Lamb whithersoever he led them on earth and their reward is in kind. Loved ones, let me ask you a question. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with following Jesus wherever he takes you? How do you do when he calls you out of your comfort zone? Do you go? How do you do when he's calling you to something that you know is going to be incredibly hard? Do you go? If the lamb leads, are you following? How are you doing with that? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, he said to his disciples and he says to us, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Some people say, well, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to take up your cross and follow him. That's not right. That's not the whole scripture. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross. And then follow him. They followed the lamb wherever he went. And John says something interesting uh, at the end of verse 4. He says, these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb, in, in the Old Testament, the first fruits from harvest were offered to God to be used for his service. They were set apart. The, the harvest, uh, or excuse me, the, the grain, uh, the fruits, whatever it was, there was always the first fruits that was set apart, given to God. They were sanctified. They was used for his purposes, and that's who they are. They were set apart, pulled out, 144,000, chosen by God, sanctified for his use, for his purposes, for his will. Well, loved ones, how many of you know, in a sense, every believer is a first fruit of God? You've been chosen. You've been pulled out of the world. You've been selected. You've been set aside. You've been sanctified so you can have a, so you can have a good time, so you can have fun, so you can rejoice and, and, and celebrate heaven without ever a care in the world? No. We're set aside for his purposes, for his will, for service unto God. And lastly, I want you to notice there's two more descriptions. Verse 5. It says, And no lie was found in their mouth. They only speak truth. They live truth. They reject falsehood. But, but get this. That also includes little white lies. How many of you know there's no such thing as a little white lie? They're all big, black, nasty things. They are. And don't, th and don't think that when we're dealing with a perfectly holy God that there's not a distinction there. 
don't think that whenever we withhold information in order to achieve a certain outcome and we're being anything but honest, God doesn't view that as a half-truth or an untruth or a whole lie. God, God expects complete and total honesty in our heart. And, and, and whenever we find ourselves in a situation where the temptation is to withhold certain information uh, in order to deceive, in order to, like I said, achieve a certain outcome, that's less than honest. And then these 144,000 are perfectly honest. No lie was found in their mouth. No lie was found in their heart. They, they lived in truth 100% of the time. And then he also says they are blameless, blameless, not sinless, but sanctified, living lives characterized by holiness, living lives characterized by those that have submitted to God and to Christ. They are, they are uh, holy and blameless, if you will, before Christ in all of their motives, in all of their actions, their words, not sinless, but blameless. They will be above reproach. Paul said in Ephesians 1.4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now the ultimate work of sanctification of Christ is that we will be presented holy and blameless before God. That's good news. But how many of you know that he's still working it out now and we need to live it out? We need to live it out today, tomorrow, and each day after by the grace of God of God. What an amazing pattern to follow. Don't you find this group a challenge? Don't you find the way they're, they're living their lives in the worst of circumstances? During the tribulation, Christ has said they kept themselves pure. They follow me wherever I go. They, they are truthful. There is no lie found in them. They are blameless. Loved ones, what's our excuse? They accomplished this during the tribulation. Where do we stand in this regard? Let me let me close with with a uh, with a couple challenge with a, with a couple challenges, a couple points of application. Could you call your Christian walk a victorious one? Do 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 some inventory real quick. Today, yesterday, last week, the past month. Would you say that you are a victorious Christian? That you are overcoming sin in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit? Can you say that you indeed are sanctified from the rest of the world? Let me, add, let me ask you a very direct question. What is one thing you're working on, you're praying to God about, you are trusting God in to be delivered from? What sin in your life, what, what area in your life that falls short, that, that you're working on specifically, you're asking God to help you, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you're a bit of a gossip, and you know it, you're a bit of a gossip, and God is saying, I hate gossip, I don't like that, I don't want you doing it, and God is dealing with you on it, maybe, maybe uh, you're a little on the selfish side, and you know it, God has revealed it to you, maybe you have pride, Maybe at the workplace, you, you're, you're not working with integrity. Maybe you're a little bit lazy on the job. These are just a few examples. My question is, what is it you're working on? And if you can't think of anything, loved ones, why not? Because believe me, we got plenty to work on. There, there should be something in our hearts, something in our minds that that as we are being sanctified, we can be defined as victorious Christians, that we come before God saying, God, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a gossip. I repent, and I need you to help me stop that for your glory and, and for my sanctification. I want to be like Jesus. God, I'm prideful. God, I'm like, whatever the case may be. Loved ones, if you can't think of one thing, there's a problem. Because there should always be something we're pursuing to achieve greater Christ-likeness under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you know we can't do it on our own? We need the power of God. And the good news is He has provided it. Secondly, do you follow the Lamb wherever He goes? Come on, be honest now. Just be honest. If Jesus says, I want you to go to this person and minister to them, do you go? 
or do you stay comfortable with the, the group you're most comfortable with? Are you willing to get outside of those, of those comfort zones? There's a ministry I want you to begin. Will you begin that ministry? You say, well, I'm not qualified for that. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I'm not qualified for this, yet here I am. If you would have, if you would have told me 15 years ago that I'd be doing this, I would have laughed at you so hard. And I'm not joking. I would have laughed. I said, there's no way. I bear, I, well, it would have been longer than 15 years ago, but I'd, 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 I didn't even like people, much less want to stand up and talk to them. I'm just being honest with you. If anybody knew me before I was born again, you know I'm telling you the truth. And even after being born again, when I believed God was calling me, I said, no, that's not God. The devil's trying to trip me up. Loved ones, will you follow him? If he tells you to call that person that you're at odds with and he wants you to reconcile, will you make that phone call? Will you follow him wherever he leads you to? Because I assure you, he's never going to lead you somewhere bad. It is impossible for Jesus Christ to leave you somewhere, to lead you somewhere bad, to lead you somewhere negative. He is trying to lead you to greater freedom. He's trying to lead you to greater Christ-likeness. He's trying to lead you to a place that's going to bring him glory and set you free. So where is it Christ is leading and are you following? Of course, we never do so in perfection. Only Christ was perfection. Um, but loved ones, I have to ask the question, is the effort there? Is the effort there? I believe at the end of the day, when we come to the Lord in prayer, and we say, Father, I need to wash my feet. I've been in the world today. I need to, I need to spend time repenting. I need to spend time fellowshipping with you. And I need to spend time asking you to help me live out your will in my life. How many of you know that is a prayer according to God's will? The Bible says that if we want God to answer our prayer, pray according to his will, right? What it says, I guarantee you that's a prayer that he'll answer. Can we all agree this evening that the 144,000 are, are wonderful examples of the power of God in the lives of believers and that the same things are available to us? Can we all agree this evening that it will be our united prayer to ask God to accomplish these things in our heart? Can we be in agreement with that? If you're in agreement, can I just ask you to stand? And then we'll pray. Oh, and Father, we do thank you. Your word says that you began a good work in us and you will carry it on to completion. And Father, there's great hope in that. Because we know you're faithful and we acknowledge that. So Father, this evening, as each person has stood, uh, Lord, it, it, it's just simply... Um, an acknowledgement of our need for you in our lives. It is an acknowledgement and an agreement that there's certainly plenty in our lives that need to be changed, fixed, sanctified, repented of, done away with, crucified, Lord, for your glory, that we can be more like you. Father, I pray it, it is each of our desires this evening to follow you wherever you go, no matter how frightening it may be, no matter how much out of our comfort zone it may be, Lord, we know that you only lead us down the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, we know that you will not lead us anywhere that will bring us our hurt, uh, bring us hurt or harm. You are our Father, our Heavenly Father. And you love us. So, Father, for the fearful heart this evening, I pray you grant them assurance, grant them trust, that whatever it is you're leading them to do, grant them the courage to follow. And Lord, help us, I pray, to be people of integrity, be people that hate any kind of falsehood. We walk only in truth. Father, we just pray that you help us to be more like your son. That is our desire. And Lord, as we see the 144,000 standing with Jesus upon Mount Zion, what a glorious picture that is. Your son will reign. He will rule. And Father, how humbling it is to consider that we're going to get to be a part of that. So Father, until we come together again next Wednesday, we pray that 
your name is glorified in all we say, do, and think. And that, Father, every day we come to you in prayer and we ask you to help us with that one thing. And then when we've gotten victory in that one thing, Father, by your grace, may we move on to the next because we know you're working. And we give you the glory, Father, and all God's children say, Amen.